The next speaker, Powell from NASC. Hello. Yeah, uh, I, I asked him like dive deep into as much as you can in the uh, in the Drug Wolf sandbox. So, Powell, yes, I'm, I'm glad you're here. I will, I will try to. So, hello everyone. My name is Paweł Sokosz, as I was uh, introduced, and I'm uh, from NASC, uh, strictly from CERT PL, from Polish CERT. And today I want to tell you a few words about uh, Drug Wolf sandbox and dynamic malware analysis from the hypervisor point of view. So actually, uh, DragWolf is uh, a project that is running for a long time. Uh, it was initiated by Thomas Lengel uh, from Intel. And DragWolf Sandbox is set of our contributions and our toolkit uh, to make it uh, a bit easier uh, to use the DragWolf engine for, for, for scale, for uh, automated analysis. Uh, so, um, First, I want to make a short introduction about automated malware unpacking, because uh, that's, how, uh, that's why we, we uh, made Jagwolf Sandbox. Uh, it's an unusual way for uh, malware analysis, because usually we want to know the behavior of the malware. Uh, we, know to, we want to know uh, mm, various IOCs. Uh, but in CERPL, uh, we are more focused on unpacking the the core of the malware, and then uh, to statically rip uh, the exact information from the core, which is called static configuration. Uh, next thing I want to tell you about is uh, how hypervisor level sandboxing is different from uh, agent-based sandboxes, uh, because it's pretty novice, uh, it becomes uh, popular, and uh, actually we have great open source tools for that, Although it sounds scary, uh, for f uh, yeah. Finally, I will tell you about our try to uh, make a fully developed sandbox based on open source engine called Dragwolf. So let's start with a few words about malware unpacking and our approach. I really like the analog uh, made by my colleagues that uh, some malware is like paracetamol. Uh, we have different packages and forms, uh, which makes the medicine actually easier for ingestion. Uh, it depends on the use case, but uh, the core is the same. Paracetamol, which serves the purpose, why we are taking it. Uh, so uh, similarly is with malware. Uh, so there are creators of malware like like info stealers that want to uh, steal information from various computers, uh, but they also need to make the malware easier for ingestion, easier for infection, and uh, these additional additional layers that are like capsule uh, are called protectors. Uh, usually they are highly protected from analysis, uh, they are losing lots of techniques, so it's very difficult to uh, analyze them statically. Uh, we need to actually use some hybrid approaches. And they, the main task is to protect the main malware from dismantling by AV solutions or by analysts. Uh, one of good examples of such is uh, .run PEX. Uh, on South PL uh, English uh, version of our website, we have a uh, nice article if you want to check. Uh, and .run PX is a .NET protector that uses lots of techniques, uh, like most of protectors, like for example, heavy obfuscation using CoEVM virtualizer. Virtualization is uh, kind of uh, obfuscating the control flow, so it's uh, less readable for analysts. Uh, it tries also to load the vulnerable driver uh, to kill uh, protected processes like AV. So we have legitimate signed drivers uh, that are used uh, maliciously to, to inject uh, own count uh, in, in kernel mode and uh, do things that, are, that we are unable to do from user mode. Uh, it also uses process Halloween to inject them so, uh, itself to another process. And uh, what's also funny technique, all their versions also used pretty, co pretty common technique for unhooking, which was loading its own anti-DLL into memory and calling it in di directly instead of uh, relying on already loaded and probably hooked version. .NET PX is commonly used by popular .NET stealers like Redline, Raccoon, Agent Tesla. If you are into malware analysis, you probably uh, know some of, these, some of these names. So it must be good protector, I guess. Uh, but although .NET PX is tough guy, uh, if we have well-prepared environment and uh, it won't detect uh, too early that something is wrong and uh, it is run in 
analyst environment. Uh, we can run it and let it unpack itself until it uh, unpacks the, the, the core malware agent Tesla. And so at some point in the memory, we have uh, the protected malware, the original malware, that usually is m much uh, more poorly obfuscated. Like, okay, there are some string encryption, there is some uh, API call uh, redirection or something like that, but actually uh, it's, it's uh, good enough for static analysis. It's not changing that much. So if we have good extractor, uh, we, can, we can get uh, lots of information from that. Uh, so, but but uh, if we want to do that, uh, we need to trace the execution and make memory dumps of uh, next layers until we get our unpacked sample. And as I said, then we can analyze it, uh, this dump statically using Yara rules or dedicated scripts or actually both. Uh, but the question is, and uh, here's the variety of techniques, how to actually dump these stages? Uh, because, okay, we assume that we are able to execute the whole chain uh, of layers and we have a good environment, uh, stealth enough, uh, so, so we finally have this, uh, this, uh, this uh, final malware, but uh, how do we know uh, that we should make a dump and which process? Uh, so one of technique is to make it randomly, for example, of, of, of whole process memory. So we are tracking the injections and then we are randomly making uh, dumps uh, with hope that uh, at some point we will dump the, the, the core binary. Uh, but yeah, but we still need to track that infection. And uh, what's worse, we get lots of useless data. Uh, another thing uh, I have saw in some monitor uh, was to scan memory with Yara rules and dump matching things. So if you already have uh, Yara rules for agent Tesla, we can just s scan the memory for, for agent Tesla in periods or when we see some new buffers. Uh, but it's specialized solution for, for malware we already know, and actually we need generic approach to dump also the unknown because uh, malware is still changing, we have new versions, and uh, we need to be sure that we have some artifacts for, for uh, reverse engineering and fixing our, our rules, for example. Uh, so another approach is to dump only interest in memory. For example, with read-write execute writes because uh, when something, uh, some extra code is injected into memory, uh, some portion of that memory needs to be first writable and then executable. And actually, uh, because of uh, the layout of PE files, uh, it's much easier to make the, the whole uh, block of memory uh, be able to read, write, and execute at the same time. Actually, that uh, specific rule also isn't very well because uh, uh, RWX uh, writes are also used by, by JIT compilers. So for example, if at some point we need to run a browser uh, within the infection, then we have lots of dumps from the JIT compiler. Uh, but uh, that's not the only technique. Uh, our first contribution to DragWolf was to actually implement a basic memory dumping plugin that works just like that. So we are hooking on specific syscall. Uh, in that case, NT free virtual memory. So we're looking for, for uh, some big enough buffers that are threat. threat. And uh, we are checking if uh, mm, we see MZ signature of PE file at the beginning. And it actually worked pretty well as a, as a starting point. So it was merged into DragWolf. And then uh, we started to extend it with other techniques, like for example, uh, hooking enter write uh, product memory for uh, looking for code injected f into another process memory and the project virtual memory for uh, looking for new binaries mapped in on process memory. Uh, also, syscalls uh, used when, we, uh, when malware injects new threads uh, and, uh, or, or uh, hijacking existing threads. Uh, so that Memdap plugin actually has uh, pretty extensive capabilities. And here are some examples from our malware database system. Uh, so we actually uh, have the, uh, these dumps from the, from the un uh, unpacked malware. And from our logs, uh, we can 
uh, check the reason why that portion me of memory was actually dumped. And for example, in that case, uh, it is smoke loader that was dumped because of the end-to-terminate process. <laughs> uh, it's quite funny because probably uh, inside the smoke loader there is some anti-VM check that was triggered, but it was already in smoke loader, so well, the core malware have been unpacked, and then we had uh, been able to, to statically uh, get the configuration. Uh, another example is Remcos that was dumped by hook on uh, crypt acquire context. Uh, some of libraries in the Windows uh, need some specific initialization preparation calls, and these are also good hooks for dumping because uh, they are usually called by the by the main malware, not the unpacker. Uh, so if you even experimentally uh, find sets of APIs that are usually called by the uh, final malware and are not, not, not called by uh, the unpacker, the protector, uh, you might be successful in, in, in unpacking. Uh, but actually, if you, if you already are familiar with malware analysis, you may feel that uh, what I'm saying is pretty familiar for you. Uh, so why uh, in What's, what's different in drug uh, So let's talk uh, a bit about hypervised levels unboxing. Uh, so you may already notice that uh, we are unpacking malware mm, based on uh, hooking on API. And uh, usually uh, in agent-based sandboxes, like in Cuckoo, for example, uh, we have very simple approach. Uh, so there is some agent uh, running on the VM that is actively communicating with the analysis manager on the host, and it is uh, doing all the job on the on the on the Windows side. So, for example, uh, analysis manager sends uh, the uh, malware sample. The malware sample is executed, and then there are lots of tricks, uh, setting proper hooks and anti anti debug anti anti VM detection tricks uh, to successfully monitor its behavior. Uh, but unfortunately, as they are running on the same land, uh, it's kind of a cat and mouse game. Uh, it's pretty easy for malware to combat these hooks by making direct calls, and uh, these solutions actually rely on the fact that uh, s they are a step ahead of the malware. So, for example, Cuckoo is actively maintained, and uh, it is able to trick uh, malware in a ways it uh, haven't invented yet. Uh, but actually, that technique, like uh, remapping into DLL, actually killed our uh, user mode sandboxes for a while. I don't remember actually the malware name, but, but uh, it was quite tricky because we have been uh, completely blind because actually the, the malware was loading its own anti DLL uh, uh, library, the unhooked version. So we haven't got any, any, any callbacks and, well, uh, in addition, as they are uh, uh, running on the same land, uh, malware can just kill the agent or can kill itself uh, after it detects the agent. So there are lots of possibilities. Uh, so these uh, solutions are not that reliable. Uh, they, they need active maintenance. So the next thing we can do is to hide our agent using rootkit, for example, uh, being a driver loaded into kernel or to move our monitor agent completely into kernel. So we have driver instead of regular process. Uh, but as we like uh, open source solutions, we want to recompile them so we uh, can't uh, maintain the proper binary signing. Of course, we can turn off binary signing, uh, signing in the Windows, but it makes uh, our environment much more different than, than the usual one. So it can be probably de detected. Uh, in addition, we need to highly cooperate with the uh, system to avoid uh, blue screens, to avoid being killed by, by patch guard. So it's pretty tricky. And finally, our protector also will use slow driver to load itself to kernel mode and kill us. So we are still uh, on the same land, actually. And our cat and mouse game starts again. So the main idea behind agentless sandboxes is to move the monitor, move the agent, to the host and trace the whole VM. And uh, it seems that it seems a bit scary, but actually hypervisors are really made for malware tracing. Because by design, 
they need to mimic behavior of the hardware, they need to emulate uh, some things, so they have multiple powerful capabilities to intercept and modify things uh, in stealthy, transparent for the guests way. In addition, hardware, vi hardware virtualization is really security boundary. Uh, that is much harder to bridge than, than the boundary between user mode and kernel mode. Uh, finally, we are getting capability of tracing the whole operating system. So we can get lots of uh, useful insights uh, from various internal operating system structures without uh, the need to uh, interfere with its internal mechanisms or, or to abuse some internal things to actually read them. So the first thing that is cool in hardware virtualization are VM exits. So we have kind of interrupts. Uh, we can set specific events that cause the CPU to go back from executing guest code to hypervisor code, or uh, how it's called in the Intel manual VM monitor. And along these events, we can, for example, uh, exit on uh, Ardo TSC, TSC instruction with timestamp counter. Uh, that is very often used for VM detection uh, by benchmarking IP call, uh, API calls, so we can uh, combat uh, timing attacks. Another possible events are these related with CR3 register, which points at virtual memory uh, page directory of the current process. So uh, CR3 is uh, containing a pointer, uh, which page tables with virtual memory layout is currently, currently used by the processor, and it is set on every context switch. In addition, we have also capability to set uh, something called monitor trap flag to single step over instructions in case we need to uh, re-execute, in case, for example, for, of exception, uh, some instructions and, and um, get VM exit just after executing the next instruction. Of course, VM exits can be also caused by exceptions, uh, exceptions like uh, page faults, protection faults, uh, software breakpoints, all kind of interrupts, uh, software interrupts in, in, in uh, x86. So actually, we have capabilities to make a debugger because we can make uh, memory breakpoints, software breakpoints, uh, and all of these things can be done in stealthy way. Uh, also, we have uh, another uh, VM exit triggers like CPU ID, Arduant, and so on. And what's even better in uh, VTX, we have a nice addition uh, called extended page tables. Uh, because, okay, we can use software breakpoints, but software breakpoints rely on modifying the process memory to inject the int free instruction. So malware usually scans, uh, for example, into DLL for, for these software breakpoints. And if, we, if, uh, if it detects any, it stops working uh, because uh, hooking is detected. Uh, but uh, using standard page tables, we have another layer of uh, uh, virtual memory mapping. So we have uh, translation between, not only between guest uh, pages and physical memory frames, but also separate mapping for guest uh, memory frames and host memory frames. And that second mapping is completely uh, invisible for the guest. So guest sees only its own mapping made by uh, operating system, and we have also our internal mapping, a hypervisor mapping that uh, maps guest frames, because they are not physically frames, uh, and uh, host frames. Well, they are physically frames, but uh, it's another, another level of abstraction. Uh, so how we can use it? Uh, so, uh, it means that uh, we have two different uh, descriptors of the memory protection. One is guest site, made by uh, operating system, and another one is uh, hypervisor site. That can be different than that, than that guest one. So for example, even if guest uh, makes some memory executable, we can make, make, we can make it uh, non-executable to trigger uh, uh, an exception when uh, CPU tries to execute something from that memory. And the trick is, if we want to put software breakpoint, we just make, make a copy of that memory, shadow copy, and uh, we modify the original memory, uh, putting the software breakpoint, and setting uh, protection bits uh, so that the memory is only executable. 
that's also a nice addition uh, to EPT that we can make uh, memory not readable, not writable, but only executable, uh, which wasn't possible in the in the um, previous layer. Uh, it means that uh, our uh, breakpoint is executed if it's part of the code stream, but if uh, malware tries to uh, override that part, that, that part of code or uh, just read, scan for, for these additional software breakpoints, uh, we are getting the VM exit and we can uh, switch uh, that frame to, to our copy that's original and uh, made only for reading and writing. Then we can uh, go over that instruction that is uh, reading that portion of memory, for example, using uh, our single trap, uh, single, yeah, uh, monitor trap flag. And then we switch back to recover our breakpoint. So as uh, that second level address translation is uh, visible only for hypervisor, it's completely transparent for the guest. Uh, but the other scary thing we need to deal with uh, in uh, hypervisor monitoring is semantic gap. Actually, VM is for us uh, like black box. We are no longer we are no longer uh, synchronized with the system. We are no longer part of the operating system. We need to treat its memory as a black box. Uh, so we need to know where is kernel actually located in guest, uh, which page table belongs to which process. Uh, what is actually loaded into memory and what is paid out. And that's something that is called uh, virtual machine introspection. And once again, we have great uh, open source solutions for that. We have libvmi. Uh, that is a toolkit that allows us to introspect uh, the virtual machine in memory, uh, finding these crucial structures, and also to modify it. So we can uh, read all the mappings, all the all the things that are needed by by our uh, by our monitor. And actually, it's pretty rich. It has very rich API. Uh, it's it's uh, C library. Uh, so we need to make our own tools uh, on on that layer. But uh, we can do lots of things. And in addition, we have some nice example tools uh, like VMI process list that allows us uh, to Mm, list processes that are running in the Windows guest uh, from the hypervisor uh, point of view. So there are very nice examples included in libvmi, which makes it easier to use. Uh, but we still need uh, a good profile of the VM. And actually, it's very similar uh, to um, memory forensic techniques, uh, like uh, looking for things in, in the memory dump from VM. Uh, because we are actually use, using the same tools, uh, we are using PDB symbols, public symbols that are available from Microsoft Symbol Server. So first we read from the memory uh, the proper IDs, so we know the version of the libraries, the version of the kernel, and then we get a PDB symbol file to get specific offsets of specific types, methods, structures, and so on. And uh, first, uh, at first, libvmi uh, was stick to recall uh, the uh, memory forensic framework, uh, but they started uh, use uh, volatility free right now. So we can generate uh, profiles from PDB uh, to the digestible JSON form uh, using volatility free internal toolkits. So it's actually pretty, pretty nice. Mm, okay, so how it actually works. Uh, let's try with a demo. And uh, hmm. I had a small fa fault here because uh, I tried to set up a fresh uh, upgraded instance from, from master, <laughs> and I actually found some bugs. <laughs> but I will try to, uh, to show you as much as I can. Uh, OK, so, but I will change the, the view. So OK. Mm. First of all, how uh, the drug looks like, how it can be used. Uh, so we have made a toolkit called Dragwolf Sandbox, which uh, is a wrapper on Dragwolf that makes it a bit easier to use. And uh, I will log into our uh, development server. And first, uh, well, uh, the Dragwolf is based on Xen. So. Uh, we are pretty limited to specific hypervisor, but actually libvmi 
uh, is able to uh, also run on KVM, I guess. Uh, so maybe in future it, it will change, but right now uh, we need to use Xen hypervisor. And uh, as a part of our toolkit, uh, we have things that uh, makes us able to easily uh, spin up a virtual machine for testing. It's called Drag Playground. So it sets up uh, the network, uh, recovers the snapshots, Okay, it will take a while. <laughs> okay, yeah. And it is based on IPython, so we have lots of nice comments. Like, for example, we can use uh, a very nice thing, thing in DragWolf called Injector that allows us to, to inject specific syscalls, uh, making us able to copy files onto VM or to uh, mount an uh, ISO. Actually, that's Xen. Uh, or to run specific command inside the VM. So we can, so we can make kind of interactive shelf. Uh, OK, let's check the, uh, the VM state. So we can connect to it using VNC. Well, it's development if you want, so it's pretty slow. But that's Windows 7, and it's working. And uh, actually, uh, let's start with uh, seeing how the raw drug wolf looks like. So I will log in back to the development server. So yeah, actually, drug wolf is command line uh, tool that involves very long command lines uh, pointing at uh, all of the things we need to, we, we, we need to run. Uh, so drug wolf consists of the plugins. Uh, Maybe I will show the, okay, maybe that's the wrong window. If we go to the uh, repository, you can see that uh, we, can, we have the lots of various plugins that are, that are, that are uh, serving different purposes. So for example, uh, blue screen detection, uh, user mode API hooking, uh, CPU ID hooking, uh, crash detection, and so on. Actually, the list is, uh, pretty long. So in our command line, uh, we are choosing uh, plugins we want to use. Well, the format plugins, for example, Appimon, but maybe you can also use syscalls. We are choosing the VM that is currently running, and we are providing a list of profiles. So these profiles made made from volatility that are. Uh, pointing at specific offsets of the kernel and uh, specific libraries. In that case, I will try with only kernel 32 and kernel base. And in addition, for Appimon, we have a list of uh, ap user mode APIs that we want to hook on. So we run in the thing, and as we can see, we are getting uh, a trace on what's happening on the VM. So actually, Cisco is pretty noisy, so I will try with only Appimon. Uh, sorry. Oh. So Appimon is a bit more silent, especially uh, if we have limited uh, list of hooks. But for example, we can run a this. And if we are able to process it, all of, the, all of that stream, and for example, grab for specific processes, uh, we can find something in that trace. Well, it's really forcing the get tick counts. So yeah, so DragWolf itself isn't that convenient. Uh, that's why we need uh, another layer that is actually able to process all that output and make it more convenient for running uh, samples automatically. Uh, that's why we have uh, DragWolf Sandbox. Uh, OK. And the other sandbox comes with a nice uh, web frontend that makes us able to actually choose a, choose a file and uh, customize uh, the analysis parameters without messing with command line. 
And for example, we can we can easily uh, turn out turn on and turn off plugins we want. Uh, choose any file. Actually, I, I I had an idea to make a demo on malware, but uh, I haven't managed to uh, run the our dirty network with that development machine. So sorry, I will like I will I will run Prosmon. And then, okay, let's not take it too much time. We can upload it. Ensure that uh, the worker uh, that is running analysis is running, because it was probably stopped by the drug playground. Okay, maybe I will check the network. Should be okay. And yeah, something is, something has been started. You can check out the logs. And in addition, uh, we have in the browser uh, the VNC view. So if you uh, provide VNC password that you can find in the config, or you can alter it to, to make it a bit easier to, uh, to remember. Uh, we can actually see what's happening on the machine. So yeah, I will up. <laughs> so unfortunately, this machine isn't well prepared for, for malware analysis. Mm, so we will see the uh, user account control. But yeah. Gottman successfully run in the in the machine, and it is trying to do something, but uh, it is slowed down a bit by by the drug group monitoring. And after some time, uh, we will see the uh, the results. So I think we should close it right now because, mm -hmm, yeah, sure. Thank you, demo gods. And then. Uh, Actually, in TMP, we can see how Dracron uh, is collecting our output for Dracmon. It is also connect collecting a pickup. So there is TCP dump running on the background uh, that is also collecting uh, the network uh, traffic on the VM interface. And in addition, there is a module called TLS Mon uh, that makes us able to get the TLS master key. Uh, but the most uh, important things are, are in this trace. And then uh, this trace file is split uh, into separate trace files for, for separate plugins. So we can focus on, on specific plugin like Appimon or, or something like that. So okay, actually that, that analysis is still working. So uh, in the meantime, I will show you uh, the, how, how the artifacts from that sandbox looks like. Uh, actually, from the production, from the from the malware. Uh, so I prepared uh, some analysis from our uh, production sandbox, and we are getting uh, files like that that are showing our, us output from uh, from specific plugins, like for example, Memda plugin or Xmon plugin. Uh, Xmon is sometimes uh, pretty interesting because. Uh, in some malwares, we have exception-driven control flow, so uh, it's valuable for for researcher very often. Uh, and also the Appimon. Well, that that output is pretty low, uh, but still more convenient than than the big file from from the drug wolf. Mm. But the most important fix for us are dumps. And uh, in the dumps catalog, we have uh, dumped portions of memory, contig contiguous portions of memory. Uh, we see the base address and the hash of the contents. So we have uh, the, the, the application. And in addition, some metadata uh, that can be also correlated with, the, with that memdap block uh, that are uh, showing the reason why the memory was dumped. So actually, actually we can run uh, Yara also on, on, that, on that directory. And we can see that, for example, Ramcos has been matched. For the other analyse, analysis, mm, 
well, we see, uh, okay, maybe without strings, it will be more readable. We actually see smoke loader and quackbot, but uh, uh, if you see the strings, uh, that quackbot rule is just uh, not strong enough, and we have found some uh, ASHA1 uh, hash constants, so that was, was positive. But smoke loader, actually, there is smoke loader, so. And, okay, we have uh, the result. It's also pretty raw. Uh, but but still, uh, if we are analysts, uh, we can uh, consume that data uh, using other tools and check uh, what happened. For example, why our malware isn't damping anymore. So we are see, seeing uh, Pratsmon, and we see some interesting stuff. For example that uh, process memory is actually loading a driver into memory and it's making a service for that because that's the interface for uh, registering drivers and we can see name of that driver uh, in the, in the uh, API call trace. Uh, yeah, so I will come back to the slides. Mm. So that was Revo Sandbox, uh, which was our try to make an actual sandbox solution. But unfortunately, uh, making a full-blown sandbox is pretty difficult. So we have been so we have focused mainly on dumping capabilities. But the project is there. Uh, we are planning to still develop its capabilities. So if you are interested, uh, you may help and contribute to it. Uh, it's actually pretty scalable because it is using our microservice Carton framework underneath. Uh, so uh, on cert PL we are we are using uh, three uh, machines, and each has 16 uh, parallel VMs, so it works pretty well. Uh, right now, uh, only the one machine is used because uh, we are doing some development, and we ha we have tried to make some upgrades, but. Yeah, it, it was able to run uh, 38, uh, 48 machines in parallel and worked pre pretty well. Of course, there are some bugs uh, because the project is not uh, that much maintained like before. Uh, you may see the Adios edition uh, because the original team left uh, PL, But I'm still there, so I'm trying to make commits, make presentations, and I hope it will be much better uh, with the time. Uh, thanks uh, for all the contributors. We have also some good summer of code projects where uh, students have making additional uh, features in Dragon and Devil Sandbox, and it was also went pretty well. I uh, recommend you to, to check out uh, our third PL page because there are articles made by them. Also, huge thanks for, for, the, for all the contributors. Mm, without them, it wouldn't be possible. And I, if, you, if you know, uh, if you want to know more uh, the internals of the drug wolf, I really recommend you that presentation from Confidence. It is on YouTube, uh, made by the previous team. So uh, it is uh, more about internals, and uh, might be also interesting after my introduction. Thank you, and if you have any questions, I'm here for you. So thank you for the presentation. We'll start with the ones who are here with the questions. Fernando, I saw your hand first, maybe because you're just sitting very close. Uh, please hand over the microphone here in the first uh, row. Thank you. So I'll, I'll be very brief. And I just wanted to know, is Dracov still limited to physical machines? Yes, unfortunately, yes, uh, because yeah, that's something I should tell on the slides. Uh, the disadvantage on hypervisor-based uh, monitoring is that uh, we unfortunately are really close to the uh, virtualization internals, so it doesn't work that good yet on nested virtualization. 
So we unfortunately uh, need an Intel processor uh, with bare metal Zen hypervisor. Uh, but I guess there were some experiments in running it in uh, the cloud or the nested uh, virtualized environment. So right now the recommended setup is bare metal machine. Okay, thank you. All right, in the meantime, so this, this seems like a very amazing way how you actually collect a lot of data regarding all the what's being run on the target system. Um, you mentioned that your primary focus is, one of the primary focus is also dumping the memory. Um, the question from my side is, how do you choose which memory is dumped or which memory is not being dumped? Is that a specific, specific trigger that says, okay, now I'm start dumping this memory and later I will search Yara rules against this memory dump? You're, you can't, you're not dumping everything, right? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's actually uh, the. It matter. That's actually the. the um, which hooks uh, do you choose? So we we try to. Uh, actually, I shown you uh, some of these triggers on slides. Like we are focusing on specific syscalls that nice. we uh, found characteristic for uh, unpacked memory, and we are trying to to dump mostly these syscalls. This, yeah. this, this memory that is related with the syscalls. All right, that makes, makes so sense. So we are doing, so we are uh, checking the stack trace, for example. We are scanning the stack to find, uh, for example, the color, and then we are dumping the memory related, related with the color. So, yeah, right. that matters. We don't uh, want to have too much noise, but we still want to have the unpacked malware there. Oh, perfect. So in, in this case, also the detection mechanism, the detection of the, if, the mal, if it's malware or malicious behavior, it's not there, right? It's based on Yara rules, as I understand. There is no other heuristics or additional analysis just besides running the Yara rules or trying to figure out if it's malicious or not. Currently, I understand you're collecting as much data as possible, and then it's up to the analyst or the next in the pipeline solution to detect if it's malicious or not. Or do I misunderstand uh, yes, that? Yes, yes, yes. Our use case uh, is pretty specific because uh, we are malware researchers focused mostly on threat intelligence, right. so we don't need such indicators. But I guess uh, the tool is, uh, we, you can actually build something like that on top of the ArcWolf. Mm. So it should be possible. In our case, we haven't just done it because uh, it wasn't that much needed for us. Uh, there was something that I heard about you mentioning TLS Mon and extracting the TLS key. Uh, do I understand correctly that this is, if that is related to the network communications, you can yes. decipher everything? Yes, so we can dissect the, the TLS, having dumped this, this master keys. Oh, this is amazing. Right. So any, <laughs> any more questions from, from the audience? All right, if there are no questions, <laughs> I would like to thank Powell for the, uh, for the presentation and for continuing development work on the, on the Drakwoof. So you get a coin. This is the 10th anniversary coin and a box of chocolate. Let's give a Thank applause. You. Thank you.